Good morning, Arise family. How are you today? You, <laughs> I bet you are, Robert. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of emotion going on today. This is my first uh, Sunday not being a pastor here and in Cambria. And uh, a few weeks ago now, four weeks ago, I had my last Sunday in Cambria uh, as their lead pastor. And it was a, a fabulous year I spent with them. And they have become a wonderful sister church to us. And I want to share a little bit about that. Uh, over the last four months or so, four to six months, uh, our sister Vineyard Church in, uh, in Cambria, they're aware of some of our financial struggles and my decision not to take a salary here. And uh, I met with their board a couple of weeks ago and they made an incredible decision. They wanted to continue to bless Becky and I financially to be here with you at Arise for this next immediate season. Isn't that amazing? They're generous. <clears throat> totally their initiative, something they wanted to do to come alongside of us in this season and, uh, and to bless us. And uh, also, they did a, a backpack drive where they gave a backpack to every student in the city of Cambria. And uh, it was an amazing thing. You know, I think we raised $10,000 for that to happen. And they saved some backpacks, and they wanted me to, to be able to bring them here and give them to you. And so uh, I have them up front. There's not that many. But if you know someone that needs a backpack or you want to bless somebody with a backpack, a student or, of, or even your own kids, or if you have a need for this, pl please grab one for yourself or to give away to somebody. Uh, we'll uh, give it away through the rest of them through our food bank. But it was another example of, of generosity. And uh, I love that because generosity springs generosity. They've been so, Cambria Vineyard has been so generous to us. And it gives us an opportunity. We're going to be doing the same in the future. On a more somber note, we had another school shooting. And I'm someone that when we have an event, that, uh, that invades our world, because especially with our own children and schools and things like that, that it impacts all of us. It was the 45th school shooting this year. We're in trouble. We're in trouble that the, the whole spirit of hate is just permeating, permeating our, our country and our world right now. Last year, over 80, over 80 school shootings have occurred. And uh, I'm just thinking this morning as a, as a, as a Rise Vineyard family that uh, if we would just take a moment and pray for those that have just lost a child or a son or a daughter, two teachers and two students and many others were injured and other students have been traumatized and it's just, it needs to stop, amen? Amen. So would you just join with me for a moment? Uh, Papa God, we're, we're in trouble down here on planet Earth. God, we're upside down in so many ways, and things are getting worse, and, and Lord, you're the only answer. You always have been the answer, Jesus. And, and, uh, but I pray, we pray, God, that you would comfort the families, Lord, that have suffered tragic loss in this, and all this, the kids that have been traumatized, and the kids all over our country, God, that are traumatized that it could happen to them in their school, and they're going to school with, with great fear and, and trepidation, God. And we're just saying, God, it's not okay. And we're calling out to you for, for help and guidance and wisdom, Lord. And uh, show us what we, you want us to do and how we can be involved in this with, with our schools and with our kids, Lord. But I, I pray your hand of protection over our kids and over the schools in San Luis Obispo County, Lord, and beyond, God. Lord, we ask for your intervention. We call out to you, God. We're just not going to stand by and just watch, God. We ask that you, to, that you would involve yourself, God, and you would stop the madness. You'd break the power of the evil one to take lives, innocent lives, God, not only in our own country but out in the world, Lord. So much devastation, God. And I pray that your love would prevail, God. Your love would prevail, and you would break the power of hate. Yes, Lord, that you would break the power of hate in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So today, if you read my uh, 
uh, my email blog this week. And I encourage you, if you don't receive our weekly email, I share something each week. And I encourage you to, to go to our website and sign up and, and subscribe to our, our weekly email so we can communicate more directly with you of what's, what's happening. But I want to talk to you with the question, what's your story? What's your story? Because you have one, you know. You have a story. You have a story that began when you were born, but it's still ongoing right now. And I want to talk about that. You know, the Apostle Paul told his story over and over again when he went to ver the various churches and he would go before leaders. He would always start with his story that he never separated the good news of the gospel and the reality of the gospel with his own personal story. He talked about that he was a, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was born in Tarsus, a very wealthy to do family. He was a Roman citizen, so he had great privilege. He studied under Gamaliel, and, uh, and he was zealous toward God, persecuting the followers of Jesus in the church. He was ardent in his faith. He believed what he believed. And he, was a, he called himself a Pharisee. This is who I, I, I was. But then he talks about something else, and something happened. I was on my way to Damascus to kill more Christians. And on the way, there was a bright light. And all of a sudden, this, this power threw me to the ground. And I heard a voice saying, who is this? And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul said, who are you? I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting. And speechless, Paul would say again and again, I got up from there and I was blind and I was led in, by the hand into Damascus and into the house of a man named Ananias to have my sight restored. God interrupted his life. He had an encounter with the living God. And those encounters are the same encounters and that he wants us to have. Not like Paul had it, but he wants us to have an encounter with, with God. Later, recounting this in Philippians 3, he says, you know what? I've lost this. I've lost my family. I've lost my reputation. I've lost everything, but I counted all a loss for the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. I thought I'd lost everything, and he says, I've lost nothing. But he took the power of his story everywhere that he went. He did not separate the gospel from his story because his story was part of the gospel, what God had done in his life. I love the words from Psalm 45 about our story and about telling our story. The Psalm of David says, I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor, of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of your power, of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful singing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He is compassionate, has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. It's an admonition that David is telling his story, his encounter with God. He said, they tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The message of the Bible over and over again is that God has intervened in your life and in my life and he wants to, us to share that story and not be ashamed of it and not run from it. My first Sunday here back in April when I was doing both churches here and in Cambria in that interim time, I told you that I was nobody from nowhere until God found me. And I wasn't lying. I really was no, nobody from nowhere. I didn't know how bad off I was. I was more than, I was empty and dead. 
But God had something more. I love Anne Marie last week. Were you here last week? But God, but God, but God. I was this, but God. I was broken, but God. This happened to me, but God. I was going nowhere, but God. I was in bondage, but God. I didn't know what to do, but God. I was lost, but God, but God, but God. I want to say it as many times as she said it last week. And my story is I was on one trajectory, but God intervened in my life and gave me something different than what I was heading into and what I had had. And that offers to every human being even bad choices that you have, you have made for too long, I was ashamed of my story. I was absolutely ashamed. I didn't want to let people know about my past and where I'd come from because I thought they would look at me different. I've had the privilege now to share my story all over the world, literally, and yet I'm more nervous today because I'm going to share my story with you, and I'm, but I have to live with you. I'm not just going to share my story and get on an airplane and go somewhere else. So, thank you, Robert. But my story is about redemption and rescue from a meaningless, empty, nothing life. And my fight has been with shame because I was born in shame. But my story is what God can do. My story is that God changes people's lives. And here's the thing about your story. Don't be ashamed of it. If you bury your story, you bury you, a part of you. Let me say it again. If you try to bury and hide your story, then you bury part of you, and God doesn't want you to bury it. He wants to redeem your story. He wants to take what has been your life and your story and all the rest of it and make it something new and powerful. And it's a testimony for others. I did not realize I even had a story until I moved to Colorado. So here we go. So I was born in adultery. My mom was a 19-year-old who had an affair with a married man who had three kids at the same time and was pregnant with another. And she had an ongoing affair with him for a while. They went to Mexico to to, give, to get married, so-called, and that gave me a name. That's why I ended up with my, my father's name. But I never grew up with him because he was reconciled to his wife under one condition that she took him back. I will take you back and forgive you, and, and you can come back into our home if you promise never to speak of this child again that you will disown him, that you will have nothing to do with him, and our kids will never know of what this has been and what you have done. And under that condition that he went home, and then I was outside looking in, and then my 19-year-old mom and I were together. It would have been easier for her to have an abortion you see, I know something. I know nobody wanted me. I messed up everybody. I messed up my dad's life, my dad's family, my mom, everything. Nobody wanted this, but here I am, ready or not. And I had to fight against that over and over again. I, don't, I shouldn't be here. It's wrong. And you know that whole idea of, of um, uh, I ended up going after that from, Babysitter to babysitter, because my mom was a partier, and she was, uh, she, was, she was not, she wouldn't be home most of the time, and she worked some awful jobs that I'm, ash I'm, I'm ashamed to even talk about some of those jobs that she had, and I was pretty much raised by a host of babysitters uh, at that time, and um, a rotation of men coming around. I didn't know who they were, and they were always nice to me, so they could get to my mom. And I couldn't, I didn't hear it, but I knew it. I knew they didn't care about me. They were just using me to get to her. And I even knew that at a young age. What I came to realize with my mom, she was doing the best that she could. But her best was not always good for me. Does that make sense? She did her best, but her best was not, was not good for me with all that. And I grew up with a stigma, illegitimate, and bastard was the, what I was known. In my day, there weren't a lot of kids with me that were like me. When I'd go to school, 
You know, I was the only one that didn't come home in my class that didn't come home to mom and dad. Where, where's your daddy? Where's your dad? I say, well, I don't have one. And it's just like, oh. And I, I began to wear that, that illegitimate, that I, I, there's something right, wrong with, with me. And then my mom, when I was seven, she married a gambling man. And that was a time where I discovered that sometimes a bad father is worse than no father. There was violence uh, and police um, drinking. I was left alone uh, for days because there were two, I had two young brothers that were born and a sister. And, um, and uh, I was left alone with them by the time I was seven. I almost killed my sister. I've never told this before publicly. I was left alone and we were playing suffocate. And I put her, we put her on the couch and we put pillows on her until she stopped screaming. And we took them off and she was blue. And I didn't know what to do. So I ran upstairs and I got a bottle of aspirin and I started pumping it inside of her so I could get her well. I shouldn't have been left alone to do this. I finally went to the, the manager of the apartments that we were living in and said, uh, my sister's not breathing. I don't know what to do. And I don't even remember what happened next, but she started to be okay. And I don't think, they didn't call the police. They didn't call anybody. Was, Where's your mom? I don't know. I haven't seen her. But that was typical. And it was typical that we were, I was left alone. It was a very dangerous neighborhood of, of L.A., my mom would send me to the store at night and, uh, and, and in a crazy dangerous neighborhood where the Crips and the Bloods would hang out, believe it or not. And I would go from bush to bush and hide just to get my mom a Coke. She didn't just have a sense of anything. Yeah, she was doing the best that, that she could. I missed a lot of school. I ended up going, by the time I was in sixth grade, they were divorced. I was going to school half the time. I ended up going to 10 different elementary schools for se over seven years. Two of the schools I went to twice. Can you imagine being the new kid in school every, over and over again? That everybody wants to take me on this new school, new school, new school, new school. That was my, that was my reality. And at 13, something happened. And I didn't know at the time, but God was intervening in my life. My best friend invited me to come live with them. I was now 13 and in trouble. I don't know what my mom was doing or where she was, but I had my two younger brothers and my sister, and it was mainly me and them. And they offered me a way out, and I took it. I looked back and said, like, how could I do that to the family? I broke up the family. My brothers went one way, my half-brothers, my sister went another, and I went with my best friend, Jeff. And they took me in, and this was a whole nother world. You had to, yeah, it was a place of discipline. You had to... You had to go to school like every day. Can you believe that? And you had to get grades and you had to sit up and you had to meals with at the same time. I thought I was going to die. It was like crazy land. It's like, what, what is going on here? I just like, uh, I, I just like, I hated it and loved it at the same time. And then Jeff's dad would kiss him, kiss him on the lips. I mean, his third, it's like, no dad for me. Uh uh, if that's what dads do, check, check me out. But there was another part of me that, that, that wanted it, that wanted that intimacy that I had never experienced before. And then after I graduated from junior high, which was through ninth grade, the family that my sister was t staying with was going to Tehachapi, out, outside of Tehachapi, because they had relatives, and I went with them because they invited me, and I went there. And lo and behold, that family there invited me to come live with them. And I took it again. I said, I, I, I'm going for it. And I couldn't believe I did it. And so I started 10th grade in, in Tehachapi, a smaller school. My junior high was uh, 4,000 students. Tehachapi was 4,000 people. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was a bigger fish in a little pond and pretty much tougher than everybody else around. And it was just like I was having some success and it was a Mormon family, and I was excited about that because I heard my dad was a Mormon. It's like, oh, this is great, so maybe I can be a Mormon. And they did all, took me to church once in a while, and, and it, it never did quite work for, for me. And, um, and then they moved to Florida in, in, at the end of my uh, 
junior year, and I was very successful in sports and baseball, golf, and football. That's quite a combo. And uh, they invited me to go with them. And I said, I don't, I want to, I want to be here. And another family I'd never met took me in. And then I really got into golf and um, got on the golf team. And, uh, and the golf pro invited me to come live with him. And so I, I, I stayed with three different families um, in Tehachapi, California, four families all, all together. And I didn't understand, but God was letting me experience family for the first time in different, in different ways. And then I graduated from high school, miracle of miracles, and I was not first in my class. <laughs> it was right to the edge of getting this sucker done. And uh, I enrolled at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And, um, and the only reason I got to go is because my best friend, Jeff, who loved me to death, he took my SAT test for me. <laughs> now, I had decided today, I should have talked to Becky, sorry, Becky, that I'm not gonna, I've never shared this publicly. You know why? More shame. More illegitimate. What I have, I shouldn't have had because I cheated. I didn't know what I was doing because I was, I was beyond empty and lost. I wasn't doing all the things that you'd think people, I wasn't rescued from stuff. I was rescued from nothingness. So I ended up going to Cal State Dominguez Hills and I, I walked on the baseball team and also the golf team. And I was working my way at, and I was a full-time custodian at night. And, uh, and I wasn't doing very good in school, but I, I made it. Vietnam War was there, and I went through the lottery, and I missed it by six numbers, or I would have been at Vietnam, and all these things were happening. I look back, I should have been at Vietnam, I should have been dead, I should have been this, I should have been that. And I didn't understand, I had no sense of God, no sense of church, no sense of hope of any of this. And then something happened, because I'd, I'd gone back to, to live with my, my mom, who was still pretty messed up, but she had found religion. She wanted to talk to me about Jesus. I said, oh, no, 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 lady. No, no, no. Love you, mom, but no Jesus. Uh-uh, I'm not buying that. That's not gonna, not gonna happen. I refused to even discuss it with her. And she ended up talking me into having a meeting with an older Jewish man named Abraham Schneider. And uh, we called him Abe. And um, so I went... He, she came over to the house, and I didn't know what was a setup, and he started asking me some questions. This is the story I've never told anywhere around here. So I went, I went to the meeting, and uh, Abe was there, and he, um, he was telling me his story, that when he was 40 years old, he was 60 then, when I was 40 years old, I found Jesus as my, as my Savior, and now I'm now a completed Jew. And, it, and he said, but as a result of that, my Wife divorced me, my brothers beat me up, and my family did a memorial service to celebrate my death. And I'm looking, I, mean, I felt so sorry for this poor guy that he would suffer like that for something that's not even true. And then he turned to me and he says, Rick, I want to share something with you. And I basically, knock yourself out, do it. And he, and he read something from uh, the from the Bible, Isaiah 53. He didn't tell me that. He read that. And I had been to vacation Bible school here and there and enough to be dangerous with what I knew. And he, he read Isaiah 53. It talks about the arm of the Lord, prophetic scripture of Jesus. And uh, he said, who's that talking about, Rick? I said, sounds like that Jesus guy. And, um, and he said, well, where am I reading from? Well, I guess that new part, because Jesus is in the new part, right? And, um, and then he flipped the script and he showed me. He said, Rick, this is in the Old Testament, 500 years before Jesus. And you just told me you thought this was talking about Jesus. And then he said, lastly, before I go, I want you to pray. I said, Rick, I, I mean, Rick, <laughs> I'm Rick, right? <laughs> I said, Abe, uh, I don't pray. I don't even know how to pray. I'm sure not going to pray in front of you. And... Uh, I said, what is it? He said, God. And as I'm sharing this, hope you know I'm reliving this in real time. I said, God, if there's a God, and Jesus is your son, and you have a plan for my life, show me. That's what he asked me to pray. And I said, uh, I, I won't do it. 
I'll do it when I leave. I won't do it now, but I'll do it. And I said this, because of your, listen to this, story. Because of your story and what you told me about your life and what happened to you and what God did in your life, not because I believe anything, but because of your story, I'll pray that prayer one time. And so I, the next week, on, I don't know when it was, that would have been the weekend and Monday or Tuesday, I finished my work. I worked from six to two in the morning, so I finished early. Somewhere around one, I got in my little closet and I just had my moment. God, <laughs> if there is a God and Jesus is your son, show me. But if you don't, I'm not gonna play the game I see others play. If you're not real, I'm not gonna have anything to do with you. Amen. That was it. That, that crazy, crazy, crazy prayer. Well, a few days later, I'm cleaning my classroom, my trusty desk mop. <clears throat> I turn around because I thought somebody came in the room. Oh, nobody's there. Okay, losing it for real now. <clears throat> I feel a presence in the room, and nobody's there but me. What am I doing with this? I forgot about my prayer, by the way. And all of a sudden, that presence grew, and it grew. I'm not making this up. It got stronger and stronger and stronger to the point I'm now holding on to my dust mop from, to stop me from falling over. And in that moment, something happened that's changed my life forever and why I'm here today. In that moment, I saw me. I don't know how I saw me, in my mind's eye or whatever. I saw me as a little kid going from school to school, place to place, and people I didn't recognize and I heard a voice say, Rick, I have been with you all the days of your life. It's like, what? What? All the days of my life, what? And I want you to give your life to me now. And um, so my next thing was like, well, who are you? I don't, who am I talking to? <clears throat> and and uh, I heard, no, I don't need that, I'll just cry but thank you. All right, I need a break. I know you're supposed to use these when you cry, but. My next thought was, oh no. Because my favorite swear word was Jesus. I had quite the, I had quite the profane mouth. I was a golfer and an athlete, and, but I knew where and when to do whatever, where and when was. And my favorite cuss word was Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. And now, Jesus is real, alive, God, and all this stuff. And, and it's like, I was just like wanting to run. <laughs> Anybody got a hamburger? Yeah. <laughs> French fries or, or uh, So you can have that one. I got, I got one. <laughs> you guys are all right. Take care of the old man. I like that one. All right. Oh, man. And my life changed forever because at that moment, I said, God, I don't know you. I don't know one Bible verse. I don't know anything about anything, but I'm, I'm yes. And I gave my life to him. I didn't pray the sinner's prayer. I didn't know anything. I didn't say, I believe you are the son of God. I didn't know anything. I just said yes to the God that had reached out to me and I came to realize for the first time in the days following, I wasn't a bastard anymore. I wasn't a bastard anymore. I'm jumping ahead. In Ephesians chapter one, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us him to himself through Jesus Christ, that's what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. It's like I discovered that I bring God pleasure. He, he was pleased with me. He knew I was coming. Nobody else did. But me being born and being alive gave him pleasure. And he offered me a life. But he was involved before then. He was the, I realize now that he put me in these different families to begin to heal me up and put things in me. And, and yet... I had no idea what, what was coming. And this is part of that idea. It's like I'm fighting shame so much of my early life. Here's the deal. When you think your life 
is a mistake and an accident, it's hard to dream about your future. Come on. If you think you're a mistake, you know, and it, the reality is, it doesn't matter whether my mom wanted me, my dad, where I messed up, it doesn't matter. God wanted me. God knew me before I was born. He put forth his purposes. And part of the, his purposes is me being in a rise vineyard right now with you. He saw all of this coming and all the different scenarios. I didn't see any of it, but God, but God. And when you feel like you're a mistake, it can leave, lead to an orphan spirit. You're apologizing for yourself. You know, I lived with these different families and it was wonderful that people took me in and it was a safe environment. They were all good, but I was always the extra. I was never the son. I knew if I screwed up, I was gone back to L.A. when I was in Tehachapi. I knew that I had to behave. And no matter what, no matter how good they, it's like I didn't understand what I was like to build along, and I transferred that to God. God, I'll just be over here, won't bother anybody. I'll just be a nice little boy in the back row. Second class. It didn't matter. I was just in. It just happened to be anywhere. I came to realize that God would have none of that that I, like you, are his chosen child, his wanted child. And maybe nobody wanted you, maybe everybody wanted you and celebrated your coming. It doesn't matter how you start. It's what happens next. So I want to ask you a question now as we move toward the end. How many of you, since I've been sharing, thought about your own journey and story in some way. Raise your hands, hi. Okay, leave them up. Look at, turn around and look at, look at how many hands are up. That's unbelievable to me. Unbelievable, but powerful that me sharing my story opened something in you and your story. And your story, I'm sure, is not like mine, but whether, maybe it's more similar. People say, I, I have your story, that's great, but others don't. My wife grew up in the church, good family, church all her life, and been walking with Jesus all her life. I wrote that in the, in the email blog this week. And it's a powerful story of what God can do. You have a story. You have a story, every single one of you, and it's still being written. I don't care how old you are, and I'm old. <laughs> Looking around, I don't know how many older people than me around here. It doesn't matter how old you are. God is still writing my story, being in this church in San Luis Obispo during this time. It's an ongoing, that I'm a work in progress. I've never arrived, and you haven't arrived. It's a journey. And sometimes we have to fight off shame. Anybody ever have to fight off shame? Things done to you, you've done? Well, in Jesus' name, I want to say something to you. Maybe you've heard shame on you long enough in your head. I tell you, in Jesus' name, shame off of you. Right now, right here, right now. In the name of Jesus, shame go. You have not any place here. You're not welcome here. Shame leave our life. Philippians 1.6, one of my favorites. Paul says, being confident of this. Here, listen. That he who began a good work in you will what? Carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That we are that work in progress. I was stuck in a rut way too long with a false identity of myself. And it was a long process that I'm still in today. I too am finding through all the lies that cheat me out of what God has for me and the life he has for me. Don't let him, the evil one cheat you out of that. And something you're gonna get to know about me being the pastor here, I don't believe anybody's too far gone. Absolutely not. I believe God changes people's lives still today. And he doesn't care how old you are and I don't care how old you are. And we got friends out there that need Jesus. And they've given up on themselves. They've given up on God. They've given up on whatever. They have no hope in their lives. And we got to change that narrative. <coughs> and sharing our story is part of changing that narrative in people's lives. 
and sharing your story, whatever it is, whatever it is, It's part of your healing journey. It's part of your growth. And there's nothing more powerful than your story. Telling people what the Lord has done in your life. And my friends, don't wait for the finished product because it's not going to happen. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes we love, to t we love to hear the stories of completion. I'm still in it. I still have struggles. I still have pain. I still have stuff I'm working through. And we don't want anybody to see that. But when we don't let people in to see the process, they cannot relate to us because we want to present finished products. We're all done. We have Jesus now and everything's cool and good. But we're also human, human beings. I love Paul's words to the Thessalonians who he was very close to. And he says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, there it is, but our lives as well. Our lives as well. And that's where we come in. That's where we come in. You know, in 1 Peter 3.15, this is a verse that I think maybe has been misinterpreted. And it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, 1 Peter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Interesting how to tell your story. See, I always heard that meant I have to defend the gospel. I got to tell how the Bible's true and how Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I had to, I had to defend God and all these kinds of things. And I need, to, I need to buck up so I can defend. But I read, that, I read that this week and it's like, wait a minute. Give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope. The hope that you have, the hope that I have is Jesus Christ came into my life and changed my life and forgave me of my sins and gave me a reason to live and a purpose for life. That's the answer I have. I want to talk about Jesus, but when I came, I didn't know one Bible verse. I didn't know any of those things. But a man told me how Jesus Christ had changed his life. And it got past my, my barriers because I had all kinds of stuff I was ready to throw at him. And he just jumped over all of them. by telling me about the Jesus that he met. And it's interesting that Paul says, do it with, or Peter, do it with gentleness and respect. And by the way, tell the story you have, not the one you wish you had. Let me say it again. Tell the story you have, not the one you wish you had. And it's amazing, by the way, what happens when you ask somebody to share their story. I did that in my early days as a Christian. I, I never witnessed to anybody except say, tell me about your life. And you know what happens? You do that long enough, and often enough, and they say, well, what's your story? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what God has done for me. And it's about earning the right people, friends. We need to earn the right to tell our story by loving people, by serving people, by honoring their life and where they're at and, and, and embracing them, right? As it is, and not judging them. And God wants to use your story People can relate to your story, by the way, that can't relate to mine. There are people that can relate to Becky's story, but can't relate to mine. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get you. That's why we have all different stories. And somebody needs to hear your story. Where you are right now, struggles included. Next week, I'm gonna talk about not hiding your pain or your limps your struggles and not being afraid to let other people see that you're not perfect and you've got stuff that you're working through. Lastly, your story began when you were born, but it comes alive when you meet Jesus. Let me say it again. 
Your story, my story, began when we're born. But it comes alive when you meet Jesus and you surrender your life to Him. And this morning, if you have not come to that place, maybe you're trying to figure it out and figure this out and this and that, the point you come to of your life is, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. All I had for God that night in Cal State Dominguez Hills classroom was okay. I give up. I give my life to you. And it was enough because I meant it. It's not the words that get it done. It's the expression of your heart with that. Lastly, I want to, did I already say lastly? My, my third lastly. Well, this is, to, I hope this is encouraging to you, not just hear my story, but it really is important that you get this, that you have a story to tell. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And somebody needs to hear it. Okay, somebody needs to hear it. And it's not going to offend them just because it's your story. They can't be too offended. It's your story. But Jim Caviezel, who actually played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ, wrote something that I thought was worth sharing. I wish I had it on PowerPoint, but I didn't get this on. Listen to this, please. The Christian life, he says, is a journey, not a destination. A journey, not a destination. It's a journey of growth, of transformation, and of becoming more like Christ. It's a journey that is marked by ups and downs, twists and turns, but ultimately leads us to our heavenly home. I love that. Ultimately leads us to our heavenly home, but it's embracing the journey. It's embracing who you are and where you've come from. It is what it is, but it's made you who you are. So don't curse it. Embrace it and let God heal it and redeem it and share it with others. Let's stand together. Okay. Besides that, I have no strong feelings about any of this. So we're going to close with a song that uh, uh, I discovered this song right when I left Colorado to move out to San Luis Obispo to help out with this church. And it caused me to weep again today like it was yesterday that all my life God has been there. God has been good to me all my life, even when I didn't know him. But all my life he's been good to me. And I want us to close with that, of a song of gratefulness, of declaration of affirmation but no matter what don't leave here today without surrendering your life to Christ if you haven't done that let's worship this last time and Lord Jesus Papa God as we sing this Lord I just pray your Holy Spirit would just descend on this place and we would experience you God the living and true God. Lord, I ask you to wash us and cleanse us and drive away shame, God, and remind us, Lord, what you've done and what we have in you, God. Thank you, Lord.